Excellent. So I have with me today somebody I I do consider you quite dear to me, Jeff, even though I probably see you once every five years. But Mr. <laughs> Jeff Galpin. And we, we, we've got a history, right, Jeff? We go way <laughs> back. <laughs> way back, Jeff. <laughs> kind of funny how we met. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to I quickly cover that, Jeff, and then I want to go into who you are. And because uh, this show is all about you, and I wanted to hear your story. Because to me, it's a remarkable story. Um, you, you, like, you, you live like on the other side of, of, of uh, the United States, yet you have such an impact in Hollywood with all the movies you've been in and all the stunts you've done. Yeah, I've done, I've done a few. I live in, uh, just outside of New Orleans. I live about 20 minutes outside the city. I live right next to the Mississippi River. So I'm actually sitting on the levee this levee is 21 feet high and the water, if this levee was to break, would be about 18 feet into my house right now. But the water's up uh, from all the snow melt up north. So I'm sitting on this levee and it's, you can't, I don't know if you can tell, but it's actually a 21 feet to the top of it from the, the road. Wow. So, yeah, I can, I can see it. Uh, it, seems, it seems like more than 21 feet, but it seems like that seems like a really big levee, Jeff. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite extensive. It goes the whole length of uh, uh, the Mississippi River, pretty much. This goes for miles and miles. I don't know the exact length of it, but um, I'll walk up it and just show you uh, in relationship to the homes where I'm at. You know, this this isn't one of the levees that broke during Hurricane Katrina, but uh, uh, last time this one broke was 1849. They called it the Great Crevasse in French, and uh, it broke right at this spot. But behind me is the Mississippi River. You can see it. There's a power truck coming down the street. But the Mississippi River is right there in the water. Wow. And then the, home, the homes are right on the other side. So it's uh it's pretty pretty crazy, you know. If you uh just trying to figure this whole zoom thing out. No, like you're said, all good, water, you're all good. The water's right there, but if the water if the water level was level, it would be probably in the second floor of the house right there. So it would take that house out, Jeff. That, uh, if that levy broke, I mean, that, that's that's huge. And it's, interesting, yeah. it's interesting that there's such a, a French heritage in New Orleans. I, I have French heritage back in the 1600s in South Africa when the, the Huguenots fled France. They uh, took their ships and they came down to Cape Town and uh, started wineries. So my ancestors were big into the. Uh, you know, having vineyards and winemaking process. And even today, the du, the, the, the toy, which is, they say in South Africa, but in French is Dutois, uh, is one of the largest uh, wineries in Cape Town, Jeff. Also very, there's lots of French heritage, Napoleon. I've been, I've been, um, my nickname at DreamWorks was Little Napoleon when I worked at DreamWorks. Uh, <laughs> And I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure you know why. Because you, how I, so let me let me quickly go back to how I met Jeff. Uh, I was, I was um, convinced I was on this new show for a, 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 a survivor offspring called Tethered, and so I thought this is gonna. <laughs> I thought you know I was gonna um, go big, have a have a broadcast channel. I was gonna go to Hollywood, which I, I already lived in Hollywood, but I mean I was gonna do this new survivor show and. Um, uh, I signed up for it, and they said everything was very secretive, Jeff. They didn't say much at all. It was very secretive. It was like the last week or the week before they sent me off to my location, which was the New Orleans, the bayous there. That's how I met Jeff. Jeff was one of the the the, the scouts, the rangers. What do you call yourself, Jeff? What is your 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 position on the reality show? Well, I wanted a survival. This is what I called. I'm called on the show. Um, and, and I've worked other shows, you know, I've, I did Man vs. Wild, a couple episodes of that, Dual Survivor, Man, Woman, Wild. Um, I used to teach survival in Boy Scouts, and I was an Eagle Scout, so that I used to do survival stuff there. So that's kind of how I got into that end of the world. Jeff, I, I mean, don't take this in the right way, but you look like some kind of a badass cop, like Robocop. <laughs> Are you, were, you, were you a policeman in the past, or is that just your, 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 your features and your structure? 
No, I, I was a policeman uh, from 1990, oh. well, from the late 80s, I should say, to 2007. Okay. They, used to call me, they used to call me Terminator. <laughs> Damn, they, they nailed it. Wow, <laughs> Jeff, they nailed it. Yeah, I can see that. No, you do. You have a very, you have striking features, which can give you that kind of appeal. You look like like a Navy. So anyway, uh, so, so, so Jeff was there to help me survive because I'm the city slicker, luxury real estate agent that they threw into the bayous. I was supposed to be there for 10 days. I didn't even last one day. I was there for seven, just because I had to be. I was there for many reasons, but I'll tell you what, it was the harshest, most brutal experience of my life. And Jeff, I want to tell you one thing from those seven days of being in the bayous with you. On the first day when they took me into the, into the bayous, um, that had that was, that was like 36,000 or hundreds of acres with, that, with that, all those um, shrimp or those red shrimp farms were. Yeah, that's the crawfish. The crawfish with all the alligators. Um, yeah. I was waiting for you guys to come on your big boat to pick me up. And they had me with this, this like local guy there that ran the, 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 um, the, the farm. He had a shirt that he hadn't washed in 10 years. He had jeans that he had taken a shotgun to. And he's, he's looking at me all confused. And he says to me, Jeff, I've never been called this in my life. He says to me, so what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm going into the bios for the next 10 days to survive, tethered to another guy. And he says, you're going to be there at night? And I said, yes. He said, you are stupid. And I looked at him and I said, <laughs> I looked at him and I said, excuse me, Jeff, he floored me. He said, you're stupid. You're stupid. And I looked at him and I was like, uh, there was the realization, Jeff, I was in trouble. I made a stupid decision right there before I take down the boat to come meet you and all the crew out in the bayous. Anyway, um, no, that's how, that's how I'm just. You're definitely not a stupid individual, Kevin. You, you're a brilliant guy. Um, yeah, you made a, a crazy decision <laughs> to, to be in that swamp at night with no bug spray and all that good stuff. <laughs> look, look, look what happened. We, we've met. Uh, you know, it's been a fun little friendship between you and I. A lot of jokes and kidding, and uh, it's been good, man. I'm glad I met you. No, thank you, Jeff. You're a class act. What, what I like about Jeff is I went back to New Orleans years ago, almost like nine years ago, Jeff. Um, uh, to to a, a technology conference. I was I was um, do, I was pitching for money for an app, and I went and I, I, was, I was blessed enough to connect with Jeff again, and he took me with his your amazing son Tyler, who by the way is a legend in his own kind. Jeff, your son, my friend, you might have some competition, Jeff, because that kid <laughs> he's styling, man. He might be young, but he's a he's a he's a badass young man, and I'm very impressed at how he brought him up. He's a gentleman. He's a hunter, he's a scholar, he speaks well. I mean, Jeff, that's a cool kid, my friend. Yeah, he's done well for himself. At 21 years old, he became one of the local board members for the Screen Actors Guild, just bought his first house. Um, he's doing, doing well for himself. Oh my God, Jeff. At twi Jeff, uh, Jeff, uh, you, you know what, but again, that, that stems from who you are, so, so then, so, uh, Jeff, I can't emphasize enough how amazing that is. You are blessed, Jeff. I just gave him the tools, Kevin. What he did with the tools after I gave it to him, it's all on him. He did, he did a good job. I'm proud of him. Yeah. I'm proud I, of all, I, my, all my kids at that, you know? I'm almost kind of jealous. So, so me and Jeff got to spend several days in the bayous. It, it, it was very um, destructive on my psyche and my body. Again, Jeff. It ended good though when I came back to to Los Angeles. Jeff, I literally I, I hid in my home for like two weeks. I sat on my sofa and I just sat there, just absorbing everything and understanding what I went through and what had happened. Cause it was it was brutality. Um in so many extremes, even from getting uh, uh, I had to get my an injection in my ass that last night because of of the the, the creepy, crawly, itchy up going into my ears and my body and up my ass and it was going everywhere <laughs> yeah you would definitely be tortured <laughs> remember 
remember the nurse came into my hotel room that last night as a, and she had injected me and you had to be present to observe and I had to pull down my pants in front of a nurse and bend over. Oh man, I tell you, uh, 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 New Orleans is not for the faint hearted. It is, it's a tough place, uh, Jeff. Even today, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough place. Yeah, you you uh you had a rough time out there, and, and look, it, it wasn't just you. Everybody, even even we had a hard time. It, it, the swamp is not an easy place to survive in. You know, we we fortunately had bug spray and different stuff, but it was still miserable for us too. It was it's somewhere you don't want to be at night in the summertime, and y'all were there, and at the worst time of the year, it was the summer. It was hot, and miserable. You know, you did you did better than most people, Kevin. Don't don't uh, not give yourself credit. A lot of people couldn't have gone as far as you did in a few days you were out there, but it was miserable, man. It was truly miserable, even for us. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, I want to be very transparent with you. Uh, I, I needed that experience. I needed that opportunity because, first of all, I got to meet some amazing people. Yourself, Kimmy, your son, um, some of the crew. A lot of crew members actually quit as well, or they, or they, they went to other jobs. But I remember it was, it was brutal on all of us. Jeff, I want to say one thing, though, and please take this with a, with a, with a sincere heart. I actually, when I came out, of, when I stepped out of the two weeks of, okay, that was an experience of what I took away from it, I actually realized I was, I'm kind of badass. Uh, honestly, I want to be serious with you because I thought to myself, if the forefathers of this country had to trek through the bayous and had to fight for, the, for this great nation and live in that, I, I experienced a smidgen of what they went through. Because we live in a great country. This is the last best place left on earth. And also, what I, what I really appreciated was, man, what our forefathers of this nation went through to give us the life we live today. A lot of it is taken for granted, and our liberties are taken for granted. However, our forefathers, I mean, they had a rough and tough, Jeff, man. Yeah, you, you were correct. Anyone who settled, especially even in this part of the country, um, had it really tough. It was hard. You know, it's hard for us nowadays sometimes. Like I said, in certain weather conditions, it's miserable. But I can't imagine before bug spray and before the ease of making fire and, you know, ease of, uh, you know, the the motorized vehicles and having to trek through the stuff and buggies and horses and all that good stuff. It, it They were tough people. They were truly tough people back then. Yeah, the sad thing is we'll never get that again. Today, there's this whole... Um, there's, there's so much, um, so much sensitivity going on. We kind of, we kind of lose our core strength and our courage and our, 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 um, our, our nature, right? We, we, we starting to lose who we really are because we're trying to be, we're trying to comfort everybody else, which is very sad, Jeff. Like I can't, I have to be careful what I say and do because there's, it affects other people. So all of a sudden, Jeff, you want to, you, if you want to voice your opinion, you have the freedom to, but you don't really have the freedom to because there seems to be a, a bigger voice than us that can really actually persecute us and hold us accountable, right? And then also, yeah. maybe there's consequences for that, negative consequences for that. Yeah, you are correct, especially in the, in the Hollywood world. You know, you say the right thing and the wrong thing could make you or break you. So, uh, yeah, you got freedom of speech, but it's only freedom to speak with, with somebody, what the majority wants you to say. Uh, you can't have your own opinion about a lot of things. Right. So, Jeff, I want to get into Hollywood with you right now because I'm, I'm still kind of scratching my head at, at how you got into that business because here you are in New Orleans, you're an ex-cop, now you're a survivalist, um, a badass one at, at that, by the way, because you're also a gentleman. I know you, you, you capture alligators, you hunt, you, 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 go, you go out on your, your, your airstream boat all the time with your buddies and you live that kind of real wild life, but there is a gentleman inside of you how did you land up doing movies? I mean, and you're not even in Hollywood, Jeff, which is just so strange. Yes, yeah, so what, what happened was, is I was in uh, college, and, uh, well, I'll start further back. I'd always been interested in animals. And um, my dad, if you ask my dad, he says I was going down the wrong path when I was about 13 to 14 years old. I was hanging around with the wrong crew. So I expressed an interest in animals, and he allowed me to work with that, have, have animals. So a friend of mine caught a raccoon, a baby raccoon, found it on the street, just abandoned. A buddy brought it to me. The guy, the next house, the next street over, um, had lions and tigers in his yard. So I went to this guy, no one really talked to him. 
And I said, look, I have a baby raccoon. I have something here. I don't know what it was at the time. <laughs> it, 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 it was so big, Kevin, you could put it in your hand like that and cover it. That's how little it was. <laughs> right? It was about two inches long, pink. No, you know, the eyes weren't open, just squirming around. No hair, no identifiable markings. And the guy says, look, that's a baby raccoon. And I said, well, I really want to learn how to raise this thing. So he went in the house. He come out with a pamphlet, and it was everything you need to know on how to raise a baby raccoon. You know, when they open their eyes, when their ears, you know, unfold off the top of their head, the oh, tail fluffs okay. up. Oh, you know, okay. everything, everything you want to know. So he gave me this, and he says, tell you what, come back when he's grown up a little bit and show me. So I was up every night, 14 years old. I'm up every night, every two hours. I'm going out, you know, high school at the time. Yeah. I'm feeding this raccoon all day. I'm sneaking him in my backpack to school, hanging him in my locker in like a little, a little, little thing. Cause it couldn't even, it couldn't even uh, crawl. It was so little. So I put him in a backpack and this nice little snuggled pouch. And yeah. in between classes, I was warming a bottle, you know, feeding him in my, in my locker and stuff like that. And then uh, about six months or four months later, I go back to the guy, his name was Danny Regip. And Danny um, said, man, you know, the raccoon was crawling on my head and all kind of crazy stuff. Yeah. He says, man, you really, did, you really did a good job. Would you want to work with the cats, with some big cats? Well, he had a lion, he had a tiger, he had Chinese leopards, he had bobcats, coons, monkeys, all this. He had a little endangered species survival center near me. So I immediately latched on him. Yeah. I really loved it. So at 14, 15 years old, I was caring for lions and tigers and, you know, every kid's, you know, awesome job. Well, well wildest yeah. dreams are because that's, that's, that's a wild dream, Jeff. Who gets at your age to take care of the wildest beasts of the earth? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was something every kid would envy, you know, at the time. And, and now we all look down upon what this guy was doing. But he was really doing the right thing. The animals were well cared for and taken care of. And, you know, not just Joe Exotic stuff that's going around the Internet. He wasn't like that. Um, but anyway, it got me interested in, in stuff. So I wanted to be a veterinarian. So... Uh, the 1984 World's Fair hit Louisiana. I was still about 14 to 15 years old. There was a guy named, and I've not seen him in 30 maybe so years. I don't even know if he's alive or where he's at. Maybe he's watching this. Who knows? But uh, his name was Andrew Simmons. Andrew uh, brought me to the 1984 World's Fair where he was doing shows. He was a friend of this guy, Danny. He had a golden eagle. He had a Chinese leopard, big pythons. and He would do shows. And he would teach people, you know, about the animals. And it was more of an education thing at the World's Fair in the International Pavilion. So I'm like, this is what I really want to do. He, he's, he's like a naturalist. This is what I really want to do in life. Nice. Well, that later changed to me wanting to be a veterinarian. So cut to me having every animal imaginable as a kid. Raccoons and squirrels and possums and bobcats and baby and, and deer. I raised deer and you know, everything you could imagine native to Louisiana I had, and even some that weren't native to Louisiana. So I went to college, finished school, I went to LSU, uh, studying to be a veterinarian. I got into uh, undercover police work, and that kind of made me uh, quit school. But while I was in LSU, I was doing some volunteer work at the Audubon Zoo here in New Orleans. And um, it was part of like a little intern program. And they came in with a movie called Undercover Blues. The original uh, title was called Cloak and Diaper. Um, but it was called Undercover Blues. And it's Dennis Quaid and Kathleen Turner, Stanley Tucci. And there was a scene where a stuntman gets thrown over a railing into a pit of alligators. Well, it's really the bear exhibit at the zoo, but we got all the bears out. We filled it full of alligators. So, you know, they, they were in sp special spots. They taught me how to keep them in areas and all that stuff. Now I had hunted alligators as a kid. Yeah. You know, we call it, we call it fishing alligators because that's kind of what you do. Um, but it's hunting. And, and, and you have to purpose. do, sorry, Jeff, and you have to do that, Jeff, in, in Louisiana because it also becomes another pandemic. And they, they, they breed so much. I mean, when I was there, I cannot tell you how many alligators I saw everywhere in the bayous. Yeah, that, that property has more alligators than anywhere I've ever been in my life, Kevin. Oh, that, okay, okay. That property is amazing. But yes, they are. They have become a nuisance animal now. They're on your, your, on your freeways. They're in your backyards. Yeah. Yeah, they could literally walk over this levee. There's alligators right behind me in the water. Um, yeah. They, they don't normally bother people, but, you know. 
it is what it is. But um, anyway, get back to the story was they, you know, they did this movie, Undercover Blues. Uh, Stanley Tucci is playing a bad guy, and the stunt guy gets thrown over the railing. Oh, did I lose you? Undercover Blues. Uh, the movie. Uh, uh, the, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, so Undercover Blues, there it is. Um, uh, Herbert Ross. Uh, uh, is that what um, Dennis Quaid? Dennis Quaid, Kathleen Turner, Stanley Tucci. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I see you. Okay, excellent. I'm, sh I'm showing so, the audience. Yeah. So that was like 1990. Um, wow. So um, the guys brought in, they brought in 12 alligators from California. This amazing guy and his wife named Jim Brockett and Gina Brockett. Yeah. Um, I really owe my career to them. They live in, I believe, Thousand Oaks uh, in California, but they were they just the most amazing people. They took right. me under their wing, showed me how to do things, and uh, basically they needed some help is kind of where it went. They needed help from the zoo. The zoo said, well, Jeff is the alligator guy here. So Jim hired me for a little bit of money. You know, I was a college student, man, $20. You know how many beers I could buy? <laughs> right? You're, you're raking get, in the cash, Jeff. Yeah. I think you get $100 or $150 for the day. I was rich, man. I was ready to buy everything. Wow. You know, Nick, nickel draft night, I could buy everybody a beer in the whole place. So I did it for a couple of days. He said, no, look, you're way better than we thought you would be. We'll put you on a regular, a regular pay. Well, man, I made some really good money while I was in school. Mm. He said, hey, that show ended. He said, you know, in about six or eight months, I'm coming back with another movie called the Interview with the Vampire. Whoa, Tom whoa, Cruise, whoa, whoa, whoa. Brad Pitt, absolutely. right? Yeah, so absolutely. He said, we'll be back and we'll, uh, we'll uh, hire you again. Well, they came in for Interview with the Vampire. And, man, we had spiders and deer and uh, pigeons and all kind of stuff, alligators and all kind of crazy stuff. Well, I, at that point now, it's 1991 or so, or 92, um, and I'm a policeman now. I, I've, I've changed, got out of school and became a full-time uh, policeman here in New Orleans. Yeah. So I was taking off days and calling in sick and all this other stuff and making some really amazing money. And um, I'm like, you know, this is what I really want to do. This is really where I want to be in life. So that show ended. I worked a few weeks on that show. That show ended. They came in with another show called Heart Target with Jean-Claude Van Damme. And there was okay. a bunch of big, big rattlesnakes in that movie. Well, we had the rattlesnakes. Jim hired me and Gina hired me for a little while. And I'm like, this is what I want to do. A uh, Heart Target with, with Van Damme? Yes. Heart Target, okay. Yes, yeah, as, as uh, Jean Claude Van Damme. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, nineteen ninety three. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> right, great back, Jeff. The mullet. <laughs> so yeah, the mullet, full effect. So I, I did that show, and I said, you know, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to be in life. So my uncle calls me one day. His name's Johnny Falterman. He's got a fabrication shop, and um, he says, "Look, I got some stunt men in my office." He said, "I don't know." you know, anything about this movie stuff. He said, but you ought to come in and see if you can get the animal work. So I went over to a shop. I'm a policeman. I drive up my police car. I start talking to one of the guys. His name was Denny Arnold. Denny used to be a John Candy stunt double. Got to it. give you, you know, what he looked like. Nice. Um, Denny at the time had done over 350 films. This is 1993. Um, he just got, took a liking to me. And I was like, you know, it's pretty cool. He says, look, I'm going to move to Louisiana. This is 1993. I'm going to move to Louisiana, and I'll make you a stunt man. And I'm like, God, this guy is so full of crap. You know, he's lying. He's full of shit, you know. Um, so we, we talk. We have a little fun. I, I sneak my police car out at night, and I'm spinning my police car in the parking lot. <laughs> he's teaching me, right? That's all against the rules. <laughs> but that's kind of where I learned to slide some cars using my police yeah. car because we, we had take-home units that we took home every night so wow. anyway 1994 comes around and i'm in touch with this guy denny and he's in vancouver he's doing uh rush hour uh was it uh not rush hour uh jackie chan film um um uh rumble in the bronx is that i think okay, that was what okay. it was called rumble in the bronx okay. yeah I remember that man. We're going back, yeah. We're right. going back, nine, nine ninety-five, yeah. Jackie yeah, Chan. So, 
so we, we film we film a year you know a year ahead of time so if it's 95 we yeah, yeah exactly 94. yeah 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 for sure so 94 oh. comes along he calls me up he says i'm on rumble in bronx he said i think i'm thinking about moving to new orleans he said my best friend died today and i have no more reason to be in canada that's where he was from got it and okay. i said who's your best friend he said my best friend was john candy he was the best man in my wedding he was my closest friend he died today and um I really don't want to be in Canada anymore. He said, I'm going to come to New Orleans. I'm going to make you a stunt man. So I'm like, yeah, whatever. Okay. You move to New Orleans. I'll be a stunt man. So sure enough, about three, four months later, he moves to New Orleans and he gets a show here. And that show was called the big easy. It was a TV oh, series. They did a big easy movie, me. but they did the big easy television series also. Got it. So he says, you kind of look like one of the guys, but I don't know what he does on the show but if he has any stunts you you're you're his double i'll make you his double nice well, this guy wanted to, his name was tony crane anthony crane um tony wanted to be in the lead actor on that show and i was the lead actor stunt double for two years and that started my career as a stuntman since then i had another amazing guy into my life um his name was cliff cudney cliff cudney came to be the stunt coordinator the second i'm sorry the half of the first season of that show when Denny quit the show, and um, Cliff, Cliff Cudney, it, Cliff Cudney, how do you spell the last name? C U D N E Y. Cliff, Cliff became my mentor. He, wow, um, Friday the Thirteenth, yeah, cheapers. Oh my gosh. Cliff, Cliff's done a lot of stuff, man. Yeah. The French Connection. He was doing Boogie Nights. You know. Jesus. When, when I'm. Yeah. Yeah. Nighthawks. Yeah, Friday the 13th, that's awesome. Look at that. Wow. So Cliff became my mentor in the business. Cliff basically at first really didn't know me. I was just some, you know, local cop that he met that was working on the show. Um, but we actually became very close friends. And, and to this day, we're still close. Um, I think of him as a second dad, um, even though we haven't worked together in, you know, whatever, 20 years maybe now. 15 years um yeah. i still stay in daily you know daily or weekly monthly contact with him sometimes um he lives in tennessee now but clip took me under his wings he was doing boogie nights well we went on hiatus in december of 1995 on uh the big easy and cliff said hey man come out and see me on boogie nights we're filming in west hollywood at this sound stage out there and why don't you come see me oh wait, like, wait where's west anderson boogie nights right west anderson West Hollywood, West Hollywood. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, the, the director, the director. Um, what, wasn't that oh, West no, I don't know who the director was. Uh, I, I'm also sure it was Wes Anderson, but again, it could be. Oh, uh, sorry, Paul Thomas Anderson, I apologize. I'm trying yeah. to go back to my Hollywood days. Yeah, Paul Thomas Anderson. Great movie, Burt Reynolds, Mark Wahlberg. Right. right. So he said, Cliff says, come on out to West Hollywood, meet me, and uh, we'll talk about your career. And my, my, I'm now divorced, but my wife at the time was telling me, man, we need to go to Hollywood. We need to go to Hollywood. And I'm like, man, I am not going to <laughs> I'm not going to California. I'm not doing that crud. Man, she stayed on me. She stayed on me. So I finally book a flight. I book a flight. We call Cliff. I say, Cliff, man, I'm here. He guides me into this, to this uh, studio in West Hollywood somewhere. Um, I mean, there was gunshots going off. It wasn't the best neighborhood. It was homeless people sleeping everywhere. I'm like, oh, man, am I in the right business? This is crazy. You know? right. I walk in, and I'll tell you a funny story about this, this deal. So I walk in, and I meet with Cliff, and they're doing in, – in the show, um, Mark Wahlberg, uh, while we were there, he stole the uh, – he jumped in his Corvette, and he crashes his Corvette in the movie. And then there's another deal with the big shootout in the drug dealer's house. That was the night I was there. Oh, okay, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, up in the Hollywood Hills, but but that's probably d downtown LA somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now that that show needed a, a certain rating, so they said it was either the sex or the violence. They took the violence out to leave the sex part in, oh. but the shootout in the shootout in the drug dealer's house was major. It was a huge, huge scene, um, and they cut it down to just seconds in the movie. But anyway, I'm I'm sitting there now. I'm I'm a cop. I'm on a I'm on what they call a street crime unit, which is a high risk task force. Um, I had just gotten into a shootout the night before. Guys were shooting at us while we were on duty, and I'm in Hollywood the next day. 
Well, I'm sitting outside at lunch. I got Moth Wahlberg to my right. I got Burt Reynolds across from me. Um, and I got the guy who plays the drug deal, and I can't remember his name, uh, kind of catty corner. Cliff is right by me. And they start a piece of the shootout where one of the stunt guys is just unloading this AK-47 in the room. And blah, 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 gun starts going off. When he does that, I take my lunch, I throw it in the air, I dive on it. <laughs> you know? Because all I'm hearing is the boom, 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 boom inside this thing. I didn't know it was coming. You know, I'm outside at lunch, and no one – I didn't hear the radio say, yeah, we're about to shoot. You know? <laughs> oh, but Jim, I love I throw that. My lunch, I throw my tray up. I dive under the table. I grab my wife. I'm trying to pull her under with me. You know, I mean, I'm grabbing whoever I can to get out of the way. And Cliff just looks at me and says, man, you need to get out more often. You know? Uh -huh. But after that point, what I'm getting at with Cliff is after that point, he took me serious as I wanted to be a stuntman. And had it not been for that day, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at. But Cliff said, you showed me that you're, you're, you really want to do this. He said, when I, we get back to New Orleans, your life is going to change. Nice. And that's the yeah. truth. That's when my life changed. Nice. I want to do another year on the show. Cliff, Cliff left to go do other shows. And I've worked for Cliff on many other shows afterwards, um, like one called October Sky. Um, it was yeah, oh, Jake yeah, Gyllenhaal. Oh, yeah. I was Jake Gyllenhaal's stunt double for the whole movie. And wow. Jake, Jake, Jake was 17 years old in, in class, and I would have to go finish scenes for Jake because he couldn't be on, on camera because he had to go to school. So a, a lot of times when you see Jake Gyllenhaal from the back or him driving or him doing anything, it's me in the movie oh, October right. Sky. Look at it was, that, yeah. It was a story of Homer Hickman, uh, okay, NASA yeah. Science. Yeah, great movie, great movie, yeah, yeah. Right. Really cool I, movie to work on. I, I worked with Jake's uh, parents on a movie called Homegrown. I, I believe his Jake's mother yeah. wrote it and his dad directed it. And this young kid walked on with his sister. Um, right. And I remember, and, and he was, they were talking about this up and coming star, which is Jake. He's been signed to all these shows. And this is one of them at that time was coming out. I remember that. Yeah, he was 17 years old. And I can remember sitting next to him in the, in the cast chair and hearing him practice his French and all kind of different stuff. A uh, really nice guy, you know, when I work with him. Yeah. And I've later, I've later doubled him on other stuff, like Day After Tomorrow and movies like that. Um, but anyway, um, that's kind of when my career changed. And then from there, New Orleans started to boom. And uh, I became a stunt coordinator. Um, I still dabble in animals in movies. And, um, you know, over 500 shows later, Kevin, we're, we're here talking, you know. Goodness um, me. Good, Jeff. I, I think just being in one movie, even as an extra, is like a highlight of somebody's life. You participate in five hundred. Yeah, I've been in a little bit over five hundred actually. I think I have three hundred something as a stuntman or a stunt coordinator. Another hundred and something or two hundred as a animal trainer or some other form of fashion. And then uh, there's a lot of stuff that IMDb just don't let you post. So. There's probably 50 commercials. There's another 100 music videos. There's all kind of stuff, you know? Can I go to your IMDb? Can I go there, Jeff? Sure, man. Jeff Galpin, boom, boom, boom. There you are. Oh, Jurassic World as well, Jeff? Jurassic World? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Logan, Battleship? Yep. I just finished the show with Hugh Jackman. He killed me on Logan. And we I had a lot of love. Well, I, I loved you. I loved you in um, was it um, was it Jack Preacher or was it Mission Impossible? Where you're having that uh, uh, um, mile high, not mile high, but you're having that, that that fist fight with Tom Cruise in the, in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, that was classic. Jeff, Jack I love your face. Too. That was a nice full on face shot as the punch comes from Tom Cruise. That was that was just brilliant. CSI, look at this. And Everglades, beautiful. There's Logan. There's Logan. Goodness me. I like the Oh, Zoo. Okay, very nice. Um, Jurassic World. Wow, fantastic. Fantastic. I've been, I've been lucky, you know, done Born stuff like Dead. Walking Dead and done, you know, cool Pretty shows like... Gun Street, yeah. Yeah, I've done... I've, I've been a very fortunate person, Kevin. I, End the game. You know, uh, you're blessed, Jeff. You're very blessed. And that's why we have this conversation because you're one of those human beings that's, that even though you've been in hundreds and hundreds of uh, films and TV shows and commercials and 
behind the scenes um, on a lot of this, on a lot of uh, the stuff we see on TV today and in the past, you're approachable. I can I can ask you to come into my show and I can interview you. Uh, you're 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 genuine. And one thing I know about you, Jeff. Um, hey, if you want to look at Jeff's credits, I'll put the information in the description box below. When you're watching the video, Jeff. One thing I I do like about you is, and it is a true. Even though you're a nice guy, you don't take BS. You know, you, 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 there's no gray areas. Either black or white, yes or no. It's not like willy nilly. You know, um, you're a nice guy, but you know, uh, you're not a fool. You know what I'm trying to say, Jeff? Yeah, just uh, it's just that's the cop in me. I got, to, uh, you know, being a policeman, you're lied to every day. Um, and I just got tired of people lying to me. So I just call it out when I see it. A lot of people don't like honesty. You know, you tell them the truth. They don't like that crap. But, you know, just I, I'd rather you call me an asshole to my face than to say it behind my back. Just walk up to me, tell me you're an asshole. And look, we'll move, we'll move on, you know. We yeah, can yeah. agree that I'm an asshole, you're an asshole. We're, we'll both be assholes today. And, uh, you know. We'll, we'll get along. We'll do a good job. We'll work. We'll be professional. And if you don't want to talk to me after it's over, it's great. But right. while we're working, we're going to do our best job, do our you know, the best we can. Jeff, I had one question I wanted to ask you because I was thinking about what would be the one question to ask Jeff that I would want to ask, or like I said, an audience member would want to ask. And if you have any questions, please hit me up and uh, comment below and I'll ask Jeff and I'll send you a private message what, what Jeff's answer is. Jeff, a lot of the time I've heard when I was in Hollywood for 16 years, I'd hear uh, like actors say, I did my own stunts. Uh, like to what extent, what does that mean? Because you're a stunt man, that's your job. What does that mean? I'm not talking Jackie Chan, that's all. But I mean, when an actor says, oh, I did my own stunts, what does that mean, Jeff? Well, you know, th this is the reality. This is what I tell people. And, and some stuff I'm, I can't really talk about. Uh, people like Jackie Chan, Tom Cruise, all these guys claim to do their own stunts. All right, what I will say is, is that think of it this way he has a, so let's just say uh whoever jackie chan tom cruise would pick one pick any actor let's go to john doe just like an act in hollywood yeah just but any any actor just think of it this way you're number one on the call sheet you're the star whoever you are you got a scene where you're going to jump from building to building will the insurance company insure you with your main actor jumping 20 feet from building to building probably not the reason is is because if that actor gets hurt the show's down the insurance <laughs> company blew the bond yeah. companies lose so who tests that stuff who who's the person that does it the stunt double now once it's perfected once we've done it a thousand times once we know that you can jump from here to here on a wire on this or you know a winch, a pulley system, whatever the stunt is, you flip through the air, you're on a wire in the air to make you flip a certain way. Whatever that is, is it safe enough to put an actor in? That's my job as a stunt coordinator to go, you know what? It's totally safe. We've done it. We've, right. we've taken 95% of the risk out of it. There's still a little 5% in it. You know, just like Tom did on uh, Mission Impossible. I think he hurt his ankle, broke his ankle or something. Wow. Um, you know, I know the stunt coordinator on that show. The guy is super, super safe. Phenomenal stunt coordinator. But things happen, man. You know, most of the things that happen to us in the business, we did it ourselves. I'm not a stunt man because I'm tough, because I like pain. I'm, you know, I'm this or I'm that. I think I'm a stunt man because I'm able to make a smart decision, a common sense decision, which seems like a lot of people don't have these days sometimes, is common sense. <laughs> uh, I can look at something and just figure it out and then know how to test it, keep my people safe, and willing to walk away from it if it isn't safe. You know, that's the other part of this business. You know, a director might have a dream or a writer may have a dream. I want to see this happen. But is it physically possible to do with one, the money we have? And is it physically possible to do without hurting someone? That's the job of a stunt coordinator. Besides all the other stuff that we do, um, budgets, meetings, hire the stunt men, you know, help design the stunts. Um, sometimes you got to be able to willing to walk away or just say it's not doable. And, um, again, you know, I'm not in this cause I'm a tough guy. I'm not in it cause I like pain. I don't, you know, I, I don't like breaking bones. That right. stuff hurts You're down for eight weeks. When I break my break myself or I break a bone, I am down for eight weeks, man. And then, then, then lost lost income as well. Yeah. Loss of work. Yeah. Loss of income, yeah. I, I'll tell you a little funny. I'll tell you a funny story. 
I got hurt on a show um, called Escape Plan, and I blew my knee. And it was just one of them things. I blew, I blew my ACL tendon, and I was trying to continue on with the scene, at least finish the scene out. It was a prison riot scene. And you could have heard my knee pop. It sounded like a firework. It was so loud when that tendon blew in my leg. The medic heard me. The medic saw me. She pulls me out. I said, I'm trying to, I, let me just finish the scene. She's like, no way, you're going to the hospital. So I go to the hospital. We have some issues with the uh, workman's comp thing. But anyway, it wound up having to be legally handled with workman's comp. You know, and it's just one of them processes. It's no, you know, no hard feelings to anybody. But I had to go deal with the workman's comp attorney because um, workman's comp didn't want to handle it right away. Yeah. So I, I walk in in the workman's comp, and we end up going to deposition. The insurance company's lawyer oh shows up. Gosh. And you, you know what depositions are, right? Depositions is a not fun. So I'm sitting at the table with my attorney. The workman's comp attorney comes in, and he says, um, are you Jeff? And I said, yeah. And he says, uh, and you're a stunt guy. And I said, yeah. And he looks at me and goes, you guys aren't right in the head. And I am like, what? <laughs> I am like, what? Jeff, I push Jeff, my you, chair. Jeff, but you're not right in the head, Jeff. But you're not right in the head, Jeff. Yeah. But, you, I, you know, I, I'm now insulted. And I'm, I'm, I'm Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and you know me enough, Kevin. I got, I went off. I, my, my fuse was short that day. Yeah. Um, so I pushed my chair back. I said, what did you say, man? He goes, you guys aren't <laughs> right in the head. Y'all said something wrong with y'all. And I, and I stood oh, he's up. he's a fight, Jeff, yeah. I stood up, and I'm, I'm ready to knock him out. I mean, he had me that mad, that quick. And I said, say that one more time to my face. And he goes, no, man, don't get mad. He said, you guys aren't right. He says, I'm not used to dealing with people like y'all. And I said, you better start explaining yourself. He right. says, you guys want to get right back to work. I am not used to that. I'm used to people that don't want to work and just want to lay on work. Oh, calm. He says, classic. I'm going to pay you. He said, he said, I am not here to fight you. He said, I just need a number so we can pay you for what your injury was. We want this over and done. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, man, the people we deal with, they don't want to go back to work. They claim their injury wrong. He said, yeah. He said, he said, you stunt guys. All y'all want to do is go back to work even when you're injured. You just put a right. cast on to color my cast to make Let it look like that. Let me finish the scene. Let me finish the scene. Right. You know, I mean, you, you got to remember, I mean, you know, I might work one day on the show. I might work six months. Um, yeah. But if I hurt, I, I'm hurt. I don't work for two months. No director, producer, anybody, or stunt man wants to see you walk on a show with a cast on your arm or on crutches. Right. Or, right. You know, now if it's something easy where you're sitting in a chair and you get knocked over and you got a cast on your foot, hey, that's great, good, wonderful. But, you know, uh, if you're not on workman's comp, you can do stuff like that. Right. But, you know, in, in general, we don't want to be hurt. So, what I'm getting at is the fact that, you know, I'm not in this because I'm tough or I'm, you know, this, that, and the other. I want to work. So if I screw up or I break bones, I don't work. And, you know, I live a, I live a nice lifestyle. I've been able to put my kids through school. I want to continue on as long as I possibly can. I don't want to be injured. You know, I don't want to be that old guy that's crippled up that can't walk when he's 70. Right, you know? right. Well, so, uh, again, Jeff, I remember when I was on set, uh, my first year and a half, I worked on set as a, as a production assistant and then as an electrician. I remember it was all about safety. So I'm not talking about the stunt department because that's not my department. But when I was on set, I mean, every morning, the first thing about our meetings before we started there was safety, safety, safety. That, that was just, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys are excessive because you have to because of your, li your lifestyles and the job at hand that you're doing. But just to, to compliment and, and agree with you, it wasn't just for the stunt department, which I'm sure is a whole other level of safety, but even for us on set, you know, because all the lights and all the grip and the cables and the, the sets and the walls, nothing's permanent. It's all kind of makeshift and not real. So um, you're right, Jeff. Oh, no, I, I totally agree with you. Jeff, uh, the other thing I want to um, ask you is, uh, I know you go to work, but what I, also, what I also know about filmmaking and I know about the lifestyle is, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's like, it's like you crave it. You want more, right, Jeff? So even though you got to work because you're going to get paid, that is the lovely part about uh, the, 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 the position. It is a lot of fun, right? You have a blast doing what you're doing. Look, I, my, my job is to break things and go home. I'm that kid that can break stuff, walk away from it, and go home. You know, I break a table, break some pots and pans, you know, break a window, break, wreck a car and don't have to pay for it. 
I mean, look, I, I got the best, I got the best job. Um, but look, I, you know, honesty, I am very blessed to be what I am, I, where I am. I get to go in homes that the average person can't go in. I get to go to, to the location that no one's ever been, you know, only a limited amount of people can say they've been into a NASA silo or, uh, you know, where they made the atom bomb or, um, fly wow. in a, in a Vietnam era. Uh, Huey, uh, I, I love the Hueys. I love the yeah. I feel the Huey for it was a you know it is it's a one of a kind of experience. Yeah, yeah. but I mean yeah. I get to do things that the average people don't get to do, mm. um, and I'm very blessed to be able to do that. I've been to some crazy locations and I've witnessed some some of the best of the world and actually some of the worst of the world. But um, I yeah I, I can't. There's no there's no money value that can be placed on the things that I've done or things I've seen or places I can go. I mean, where else can you go? And they pay you to go to the white house. They pay you to go to Bulgaria. They pay you to go to California and go ride a roller coaster, you know, 20 right. times, you know, I mean, I've had the craziest jobs, but just go ride this ride. Let's see how long it takes. <laughs> to <throw up>. you <laughs> know? I'll do it. All right. Well, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> After the twentieth time on a roller coaster, it's kind of like, oh, all right, come oh, on. Oh man, you know? oh. Je Jeff, but the nice thing about working on sets and being in the Hollywood is, uh, you, you you eat nicely. Um, I love craft service table. I mean, the bigger the show, the the more spoiled you get. Uh, and also, I you know, actors are not untouchable. I've I've I'm talking even I've worked with Dennis Quaid. I've worked with Tyrese Gibson, Giovanni Ribisi. Um, oh man, I've met Jeff Goldblum. I've, I've met some amazing human beings. They're actually, they're just human beings. They're just like me and you, my friend. I mean, at the end of the day, I would sit in, even at, craft, at, at lunch, having lunch with, with all, all these new celebrities. They're celebrities. just good human beings. Yeah, I've, I've you know, I've, I've become friends with a lot of people. I lost I you. Okay, there. Can you hear me? Yeah, say that again, Jeff. Say that again. I, I become good friends with some actors, um, and and some who I call close friends. But unfortunately, two of them died. One being Vern Troyer, who played Mini Me on Austin Powers, and Paul Walker, two two, you know, very unique individuals who were just good people, man. You know, um, somebody you'd be proud to call a friend. You know, he you just call them on their cell or send them a text message and crack a joke or, you know, send a picture of you with your finger in your nose or, you know, just something silly, something yeah. crazy. So, uh, you know. Jeff, talk about, talk about Paul Walker just for, just for a quick second, only because even my wife was very affected by his death. And if my wife doesn't know Paul Walker. I mean, you know, I meet a lot of people. Uh, uh, how come his loss was such a massive impact? Uh, I, I help me understand I think, it because my wife was, Really, I mean, she, we went, we, even my son wanted to go see where John, uh, Paul Walker had passed away. It was a very, yeah, in LA, it was a very interesting, sad time, Jeff. Well, Paul, I met Paul on a show called Ours. It was about a guy stuck in a hospital um, trying to keep a generator alive because of his newborn uh, child was on a, on a, on a, in, a, in an incubator. So he was struggling to, um, keep this incubator alive with, during Hurricane Katrina kind of thing, you know, flood waters, everything. So I met Paul and within a week we were just hitting it off because Paul was a big hunter. He liked guns. He liked to do outdoorsy stuff. He was just a real guy, wow. you know? Um, and uh, we hit it off before you know it in a week or so later, we were, we were hunting alligators at night. Um, I was with <laughs> Paul. I took Paul on his first alligator hunt, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I got a picture on my website or somewhere with me and Paul with his first alligator. Anyway, Paul was just one of those unique individuals that was just a good person, man. Okay. You know, I I accredit Paul for for um having having Tyler move in with me when his mother and I divorced. You know, as in most situations, the mom always gets the children, um, and I fought very hard to keep my son. You know, but I you know like you want every fifty fifty with your child. Well, we were riding home from alligator hunting one night and um, Paul was talking about his daughter and I'm not going to get into the particulars of his deal, but he, he, he had a, uh, it was a tough time for him. His, his separation from his, his, 
uh, his his daughter's mom, Meadow's mom, and um, he just started talking about it, just open and honest, like totally candid conversation. And um, after I dropped Paul back off at his at his house that he was staying at here in New Orleans, my son was with me that night, and he said, "Dad, he was talking about me, wasn't he?" And I said, "No, Tyler, he wasn't." And you know Tyler, so I said, "No, Tyler, he wasn't." And he says, "Yes, he was. He was talking about me." And I said, no, I said, he was talking about his daughter, Meadow. That's all the things that him and his, his ex went through and da, 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 da. He said, well, dad, I want to live with you. I want to be like his daughter. And uh, the funny thing is I've tried to reach out to Meadow to tell her that story and never could get her. Um, hopefully one day I'll reach out and tell her how great her dad was. But um, I, I credit Paul Walker for making my son come, you know, what, dad, I want to move with you. And uh, I, I look, think look, look that's... Look at Tyler today. Look at Tyler today. I just got goosebumps, by the way. I know you can't say it. JP gave me goosebumps. So yeah, somehow sure. that remarkable human being, whatever he, his gift was, he touched the entire world. And I appreciate that story. It's very special, Jeff. Yeah, Paul, Paul meant a lot to me. And, that, you know, after that movie, this business takes us all over the place. You know, Paul went and did Fast 7 when he eventually died. Um, but he was somebody that we, I would just text, you know, in the evening, send him a joke, send him a hunting picture, um, you know, just say, hey, buddy, how you doing? And, we, you know, two or three words back and forth. But that's the kind of, you know, that's kind of friend, that's friends. That's, you mm -hmm. know, he wasn't the celebrity. He was Paul. He was a friend of mine. You know, I could care less who he, who he was or what he did in his life. He was a friend. Yes. And, um, wow. That's you know, that, that's how I treat most of these actors as friends. I, you know, you either want to be one or you don't. You know, if you don't, that's great. We, we professional acquaintances, that's a good deal. But, um, you know, you treat you treat these actors like you said, they're average people. They are. They put their pants on the same. You know, they, they get a little bit of privilege because of who they are or what they've done. But when you come down to it, most of them are just average people that, you know, just like you and I. And they, 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 they have done extraordinary things. And so they get their, 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 their elevation in life. To yeah. Jeff, thank you, Jeff. I want to end it here, please, because of the timing. Jeff, I always like to ask at the end of my show, um, what's the one thing, I, I know our circumstances, we're in quarantine right now. It's the 4th of May. What's the one thing that you can leave with people to inspire them? Or if they're watching this and they like your stories, what can you give us some, uh, like, uh, uh, some hope or some inspiration or motivation, Jeff? Well, I, I could just say, you know, I never wanted to be a stunt man and I had to work hard to be where I'm at, but basically anything's possible. If you see something you like, you want to do it, just go for it, man. Then, you know, I've been told no a thousand times, like you've heard actors say, you know, a thousand no's the one yes. I, I've had that happen. I've, um, you know, I've been told no, get away from here. And I just kept going and eventually persistence prevails. Right. Um, Anything is possible, man. Like you said, it's the greatest country in the world. And um, if you want it bad enough, don't let anyone tell you no. Hey, you know, even man. If they, they, they knock you down. Yeah. Just step yeah. back up and, and reinvent yourself and come, come at it a different way. Never quit going at it. Just pick a new angle. If your angle ain't working, go at it another way. And then when you get to where you are, just remember where you came from. Because so many people forget where they came from. You know? Um, yeah. You know, I've helped out my friends. I brought my friends. I brought my family in the business. I brought my friends along with me. Some of them became stuntmen and some of them just couldn't handle this lifestyle and this business because you work one day and you might not work for six months. Right. Um, it's, a hard, it's a hard, you know, lifestyle to live. But, you know, just my, my deal is if you see something you want, go for it. And just don't let anyone tell you you can't because they're full of crap. You know, you just got to want it, Kevin. I mean, I'm watching you. <laughs> I'm watching you. I'm watching you, Kevin, on Facebook a lot. You know, I, I see everything you do, and um, I mean, you're 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 an example of it. You know, you come from South Africa, with, with not a lot, and uh, I mean, you're doing real well for yourself, man. And um, I'm I, proud I, to know I, you. I came here you know? with twenty dollars in my pocket and one suitcase on a one-way ticket that my dad sent me to America because he said South Africa was too small for me. And Jeff, let me tell you, what, I failed many, 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 many times. It's okay. I fail forward. I get up. I figure it out. I have to, Jeff. I just have to. I'm not going to be some squirrel hiding in, in a, little, a little log because of failures. No, no. I, right. I, to me, this is, this is the greatest nation in the world, which means it's got the greatest opportunities in the world. So there's, there's one there for me somewhere, Jeff, somewhere. Yeah. 
You know, he said, this, we're in the greatest country in the world, even if you don't like who, who's in office or who's not in office, who's going to be in office. Yeah. You can make what you want here. You can make, you can make anything happen. You just got to want it bad enough. The problem is a lot of people don't want it. They want, want to do work for it. They want it to be given to them. When anything given is not worth having. You know, so it, it's always better when you work for it. You appreciate right. it more. Right. You, you've, you've, you've earned it. You've earned it. Jeff, thank you so much, my friend. Hey, guys. Um, Jeff, I'll put Jeff's social media contact in the description below. If you've come this far and you've really, it's almost like an hour, which I'm so privileged to have Jeff's time for that long. Um, please connect with Jeff on social media. Please don't bother him unless it's, you just, you're a fan. I think it's great. Again, also, I want to thank Jeff Galpin, um, who is a friend who's always been there for me, any and every time I've reached out to him. And Jeff, uh, thank you for being with us. And I'm hoping just to share this. And I've got nothing but good things to say about you, buddy. You're one of a kind, Jeff. Uh, you are too, Kevin, man. A pleasure to be on your little uh, your show here. Thank and, you. Uh, anything I can do for you, please call me. I will. Uh, when I pop by New Orleans or when you come this as a side, I know it isn't often because you're so busy. We'll, we'll reconnect. Thank you, Jeff, for your time, buddy. All right. You buying coffee next time I'm there? I will. I'll let you know when this is live. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. Take, take care, Kevin. Thank bye, you. Bye. Man.